Hello, today I will be going into an in-depth explanation of immunohistochemistry. This presentation will cover the theory behind immunohistochemistry. So first of all, what is immunohistochemistry? Immunohistochemistry, abbreviated as IHC, is a commonly used method of immunostaining. IHC is used to detect and localize specific antigens in a tissue sample with the use of antibodies that will bind to particular antigen of interest. So this an antibody-antigen interaction is visualized by antibody-conjugated enzymes. One commonly used enzyme is peroxidase. In the case where you have a peroxidase-conjugated antibody, a chromogenic substrate is used for visualization. Commonly used chromogenic substrates include DAB and BCIP slash NBT. As shown in the image on the top right, a brown pigment is formed from DAB as a result of its oxidation by the peroxidase which is tagged to the antibody. This brown pigment precipitates at the location of our antigen of interest, and this pigment is what we see on an IHC stained image, such as the one on the, on the bottom right. The pigment is localized to regions of tissue containing the specific antigen. In this sample image, the marker GFAP is being detected with a peroxidase conjugated antibody. Now, in the case of immunofluorescence, the antibody is tagged with a fluorophore as opposed to a chromogenic reporter. A fluorophore is a small organic molecule that can be visualized using a fluorescent microscope. Now, to get into more details surrounding IHC, there are a few strategies that are sometimes used for detecting antigens in a tissue sample. First of all, there is the direct IHC detection method in which only one type of antibody is used. So this antibody is tagged with a chromogenic reporter or fluorophore, and it binds directly to the antigen of interest. Additionally, there is the indirect IHC staining method where multiple antibody types are used. The primary antibody is an unlabeled immunoglobulin that binds to the desired antigen. From there, a second labeled antibody that binds to the first is used for detection. In order for this to be possible, the secondary antibody must be raised against the immunoglobulin of the animal species in which the primary antibody was raised. Indirect IHC staining is more sensitive than direct detection strategies because of signal amplification, which occurs as a result of several secondary antibodies binding to each primary antibody. Another method of amplification is by conjugating primary antibodies to several biotin molecules. These biotin molecules interact with complexes of avidin or streptavidin protein bound to an enzyme. Finally, the last detection method is called counterstaining. This is where the IHC for a target antigen is accompanied with a counter stain to provide contrast for the primary stain. A very common example of this is the hematoxylin and eosin stain, or H&E stain, that is routinely performed on pathology slides. The hematoxylin stains cell nuclei a purplish blue, and the eosin counter stain provides contrast by staining the cytoplasm and extracellular matrix pink, with other cell structures taking on different shades of these colors. Now, I will get into some of the theory behind immunohistochemistry. So how is IHC possible in a lab setting? Well, one thing to consider is where we get the antibodies that we use in the IHC process. So first of all, we'll need to talk about antibody diversity. The immune system contains genetically heterogeneous B cells, which are each capable of recognizing more than a trillion different antigens. This diversity in genetically homogeneous B cells is usually dictated by the production of these antibody molecules. Each antibody is comprised of heavy and light chains. The genes that code for these heavy chain regions are found on chromosome 14, while kappa and lambda light chain genes are found on chromosomes 2 and 22, respectively. Now, both heavy and light chains contain some regions that are constant and some regions that are variable. Variable regions differ between antibodies. The antigen binding site on antibodies, circled in the image on the right, is a variable region. And this is the reason that antibodies can have specificity to certain antigens. Now, diversification of antibodies takes place in the primary lymphoid tissue. This is where random recombination of the variable diversity and joining gene segments occurs to form the variable regions of the light and heavy chains of each antibody. These three types of gene segments, variable, diversity, and joining, 
are often abbreviated as VDJ. Immunoglobulin heavy chain region contains 65 variable or V genes, 27 diversity or D genes, and 6 joining or J genes. The light chains have numerous V and J genes but no D genes. A huge number of VDJ recombinations are possible, resulting in many different antibodies being generated, each with different variable regions. Since the antigen binding site is a variable region, it differs between antibodies and this results in uniqueness, with each antibody having a different antigen specificity, as mentioned previously. It should be noted, once a B-cell produces an antibody gene during VDJ recombination, it cannot express any other variable region, thus each individual B-cell can produce one type of antibody. And that's how genetically homogeneous B-cells can recognize over a trillion antigens through different antibody production, which is made possible with VDJ recombination. So now we'll go into more detail about how this VDJ recombination works. As we know, this process of B-cell diversification takes place in the lymphoid tissue of the bone marrow. The first step of developing the B-cell is a recombination between D and J gene segments of the heavy chain region of the antibody. DJ recombination is followed by the joining of one V gene coming from a location more upstream of the DJ complex, forming a rearranged VDJ gene. So the final transcript for the immunoglobulin heavy chain will contain the VDJ region and the constant mu and delta chains. Once the mRNA is processed, translation leads to the formation of the antibody heavy chain protein. This process of VDJ recombination for the heavy chain is shown in the diagram on the right. Light chain recombination is similar but only contains V and J genes and forms an immunoglobulin kappa or lambda light chain protein. The process of VDJ recombination is mediated by a group of lymphocytic specific enzymes called VDJ recombinase. VDJ recombinase recognizes and binds to recombination signal sequences, abbreviated as RSSs, which are present in the gene sequence. So following binding, the VDJ recombinase flanks the variable diversity and joining gene segments. RSSs contain spacer regions, which correspond to one or two turns of the DNA helix. Thus, RSS spacer regions are always either 12 or 23 base pairs in length. Now, it's important to note that VDJ recombination is always dependent upon these two components, the first being the RSSs present in the gene segments, and the second being the VDJ recombinase that is used. Some recombinase enzymes, such as one called Artemis, can have variability in the cleavage site, which can affect the way VDJ recombination occurs. Additionally, a recombinase enzyme called terminal deoxynucleotidal transferase adds random nucleotides to the DNA strand to further increase antibody diversity. Once VDJ recombination of the light and heavy immunoglobulin regions are completed, these proteins are formed. Assembly of the immunoglobulin mu heavy chain with one of the light chains being either kappa or lambda result in the formation of membrane-bound immunoglobulin M receptors or immunoglobulin G antibodies, which are secreted by plasma B cells. Immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin G are isotopes of the same antibody, simply adapted for different functions. Their variable region is the same, meaning they have the same antigen and epitope specificity, but they differ in constant regions. Thus, the progeny of a single B cell can produce many antibodies which are all specific for the same epitope, but it also has the ability to control the effector function of each antibody, appropriate for each antigenic challenge. The image on the right shows the layout for an antibody molecule, including areas of heavy and light chain as well as constant and variable regions, including the antigen binding site. Now that we know all about antibody production and antibody diversity, let's talk about the different types of antibodies that can be used in immunohistochemistry and how we collect these antibodies to be used in these IHC lab procedures.
There are two types of antibodies that are commonly used for these procedures, polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies. Polyclonal antibodies come directly from animals which are injected with a peptide agonist, following their secondary immune response when antibodies specific to this antigen are produced in order to target and eliminate the antigen. The collection of polyclonal antibodies following the immune response leads to the collection of a mixture of antibodies that all recognize the same antigen but that recognize several epitopes. This is because the antibodies that are collected come from a number of different B cells, which each produce slightly different antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are different in that they show specificity for a single epitope. Polyclonal antibodies pose a higher risk of possible cross-reactivity with other antigens since polyclonal antibodies recognize many epitopes, whereas monoclonal antibodies have less chance of cross-reactivity due to their high specificity. It is for this reason that monoclonal antibodies are more commonly used in IHC for clinical procedures, including things like diagnosis or therapy of diseases. On the other hand, one benefit of using polyclonal antibodies is that they have a higher sensitivity for recognizing antigen. For this reason, polyclonal antibodies are often used for general research purposes. Thus, whether polyclonal or monoclonal antibodies are used in IHC depends on the particular situation. Next, I'm going to go over how monoclonal antibodies are derived. So monoclonal antibodies are generated through the hybridoma of a single B cell. What is a hybridoma? Well, a hybridoma is a culture of hybrid cells which are a result of the fusion between a specific antibody-producing B cell with a proliferating non-antibody-producing myeloma cell. This hybridoma holds the antibody-producing property of the B cell and the immortal property of the cancer cell. The hybridoma cells are cloned, and with each cloned hybridoma cell producing the exact same antibodies, you get the production of monoclonal antibodies. This means all the antibodies are chemically identical and thus have specificity to the same epitope. Now I will go through the process of this hybridoma technology and show how it is utilized to create monoclonal antibodies. So the first step is immunization of a mouse. We introduce a particular antigen to a mouse multiple times over a few weeks. This leads to proliferation of specific B cells and some of them differentiating into plasma cells. This is through the process of secondary immune response. From there, we isolate bulk B cells from the spleen and we fuse these B cells with myeloma cells. These myeloma cells are non-antibody producing and lack the HGPRT gene which is needed for nucleotide synthesis. This means myeloma cells cannot replicate their DNA and reproduce in the HAT medium. This ensures that only fused cells survive in the culture. Polyethylene glycol is also present in the media and is used to make membranes more permeable for easy fusion of B cells and myeloma cells. Once the hybridoma is formed between the two cell types, clonal expansion leads to many more hybridomas being produced. Each hybridoma produces the same antibodies. These monoclonal antibodies can now be collected and used. The last step of the process is to screen hybridization cultures for suitable cell lines. We can label the antibodies and test them on immobilized antigen to find the epitope-specific antibody that works best at recognizing our antigen of interest. And that's it. That's the breakdown of immunohistochemistry. Please feel free to subscribe to our channel for more videos from this series on histopathology topics.